Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the second European Policy Dialogue Forum on Refugees and Migrants entitled Contributing to the Social Inclusion of Refugees and Migrants in Europe through Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue. My name is Aleksandra Djuric Milovanovic and I'm the project manager of the Network for Dialogue at the International Dialogue Center CAICID in Vienna. And I will be the MC uh, during the two days of the forum. Please note that this opening plenary is recorded and also live streamed on the YouTube channel. The European Policy Dialogue Forum was initiated by CAICID and Network for Dialogue in 2019 when we have gathered in Athens, Greece, and discussed current challenges of refugees and migrants in Europe, what can we do? Around 60 international participants discussed the challenges of effective integration, both on the ground and at the policymaking level. Let us all remind ourselves on, what, uh, on that first encounter with the short two minute video from the last year. 70 million people are displaced worldwide as a result of persecution, conflict or violence. In 2019, more than half a million asylum applications were submitted in Europe. When arriving in Europe, refugees face many challenges in their social inclusion process. Although there are policies to support newcomers, they can be slow to adapt to evolving circumstances. This is why the European Policy Dialogue Forum on Refugees and Migrants is important, because it builds dialogue without walls. It brings together policymakers, religious leaders, academics and civil society, such as CAICID's Network for Dialogue members, to find new and better ways to foster the social inclusion of refugees and migrants. The Network for Dialogue brings together local faith and dialogue actors from a range of European countries to empower interreligious and intercultural action for refugee and migrant inclusion. The Policy Forum can enable a very unique voice to be promoted um, and mobilised from faith communities to policymakers, which can help policymakers to think slightly different around approaches to integration of refugees. The Forum provides interactive exchanges where success stories and experiences are translated into further action, strengthening thus the social inclusion of refugees and migrants through dialogue. And I think the format is also really great, the way that it's been done, like this real emphasis on dialogue and conversation. So there's very little, very few talking heads. It's really about bringing people together to develop solutions. If you're working in Europe on the social inclusion of refugees and migrants and support them through dialogue, visit us at kaiseed.org slash refugees and contact us at networkfordialogue at kaiseed.org. We will continue uh, with the opening ceremony, um, having in mind that our Secretary General uh, Faisal bin Muammar uh, had some uh, technical challenges with uh, his uh, Zoom connection. Uh, we will wait until he connects, but continue with the program as following. Having in mind that in the second half of 2020, Germany has the EU presidency, we wanted to organize policy dialogue forum in Bonn uh, Germany with the support of the German Foreign Ministry and the European uh, Commission representation in Germany. Due to COVID-19, a physical meeting in Bonn was made impossible, but we still appreciate the support of the German Foreign Ministry and the European Commission representation in Germany behind the scenes. As a keynote speaker of the Second European Policy Dialogue Forum, it is my great honor to introduce His Excellency Stefan Mayer, Parliamentary State Secretary of the German Federal Ministry of the Interior, Building and Community, and Member of the German Parliament. The title of his intervention is Encourage and Promote the German Way to Integration. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Excellencies, Eminences, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Mr. Boyan, uh, dear Mr. General Secretary uh, Bin Mouma, um, dear Mr. Hofmeister, dear Mr. Imam uh, Yahaya, uh, dear Mr. De Bruver. Uh, firstly, I want to thank um, the Kahit Dialogue Center and the Network for Dialogue 
very much for organizing and for hosting this uh, high level uh, second European policy dialogue forum uh, on refugees and migrants. And uh, I really want to underline that uh, it's an excellent uh, platform to share different views, uh, experiences uh, on this, uh, I would say, uh, prior topic uh, of integration. Uh, it's not only a prior topic for Germany, for the German um, federal government, but uh, I would say um, it's one of the most important topics of this uh, century. Um, on behalf of the German government, I only can underline that uh, especially Germany needs migration and certainly uh, in the linkage with migration, uh, integration is uh, essential. And uh, it's, uh, as I said, uh, one of our uh, prior topics. Um, the second forum will look in detail uh, at the current uh, social uh, integration of refugees and migrants in Germany uh, and in Europe. As one of the parliamentary state secretaries at the Federal Ministry of the Interior uh, for uh, Building and Community responsible, responsible for migration and integration, uh, I was very glad to uh, accept your uh, invitation. Within the federal government, the federal ministry of the interior building and community is responsible for legal matters and measures concerning integration. This is an important task, as you can see from the numbers of participants uh, in our integration courses, uh, for instance. Since 2015, since the beginning of the uh, huge influx of uh, migrants, some 1.2 million people have taken part in these courses, which I will come back to in a moment. Our integration policy is based on the principle of offering support on the one hand and requiring uh, effort in return on the other hand, or in German, we say fördern and fordern, fördern und fordern. Integration is both an offer and an obligation. Integration can work only as a two-way street. One thing I noticed uh, when preparing for this forum is that our integration strategy touches on almost every one of the specific topics of this forum, almost as if we had coordinated this uh, in advance. What do I mean by this? Regarding the first specific topic, strengthening social inclusion in education. The very first basic requirement for successful integration is learning the language uh, of the host country, closely followed by understanding the local culture and certainly also the values of the country. This is not only an empty platitude. The key question is how can the government put this principle into practice? Part of Germany's answer to this is with the integration courses I just mentioned. This basic integration service is aimed at people who will remain in Germany permanently, especially those who are accepted as refugees or asylum seekers. Since 2005, we have steadily developed our integration courses to meet migrants' needs within a consistent system applying the same quality standards everywhere in Germany. And in a federal system like Germany's, applying the same standards everywhere takes some doing because we have 16 different states and certainly 16 different uh, state governments uh, who have their own thinking. Individualized offerings range from courses for people who are illiterate and those who are literate in their own language but need to learn the Latin alphabet to courses uh, for the deaf Course especially tailored to the needs of women, parents, or young people. Through to intensive courses for participants who are especially fast learners. The important thing is, no matter the conditions for enrollment, all courses types consist of a language course and an orientation course where participants learn the basics about our system of government, our history and culture, our rights and duties, and the different ways we live together in our society. In Germany, the teaching of language and values goes hand in hand from the start. Now, one may ask, can integration be taught in the classroom? The uni equivocal answer from a lawyer is, it depends. Or more precisely, the classroom alone is not enough theory learned in the classroom needs to be applied in practice, certainly. 
A language and a culture can only be learned through use in daily life in interaction with members of the host society. This is why our language learning strategy includes both formal and informal elements from the start. Since 2019, one of these informal elements has been a very special tandem language learning project. The organization uh, Start with a Friend matches integration courses, participants with members of clubs and other socially engaged organizations to learn German in an informal setting. At the same time, this project results in the best kind of integration by getting migrants independently engaged in their local communities in their new country. This project leads us to the next specific topic of this second forum, building trust in local communities. Here, it is fitting to quote a sentence often heard in Germany, integration takes place at the local level. Another empty platitude, you might think so, but this sentence means more. It represents an important insight gained from many years of uh, integration policy. True integration takes place where migrants live their lives, not in remote government capitals, unless one happens to live there, of course. What integration actually means is becoming part of our local community. But how can we far away in Berlin or in any other distant capital reinforce that progress at local level. It's obvious that migrant organizations, volunteers and other active in social society, in civil society and charitable organizations are at the heart of successful integration and are a bridge to the true participation by every individual. We must back them up and support their work wherever possible. One model project that the Federal Ministry of the Interior launched in 2015 is the Houses of Resources. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the idea behind this project is helping others to help themselves. With a minimum of bureaucracy, we provide a, a variety of infrastructure to help small, often very new and innovative initiatives that develop out of local activities and therefore know best what the local needs are. An evaluation has confirmed that the Houses of Resources is a success. We are expanding this project and will also increase its presence in rural areas going forward. Further, migrant organizations play a vital role in the integration process and the Federal Ministry of the Interior has recognized that. Since 2013, it has funded the structural development of migrant organizations. In 2019, this funding was reorganized in a program of structural funding for migrant organizations at, feder at the federal level. The aim is to provide permanent long-term funding, which can be accessed through a clearly structured program. Dear ladies and gentlemen, this overview of the German system of integration would not be complete without mentioning what we like to call the most important triviality in the world, sport. 31 years ago, it marked a major anniversary was last year, the federal program Sport for All, sport with ethnic German resettlers was launched in four federal states for ethnic Germans from Eastern Europe who had relocated to Germany. Since then, the program has been steadily expanded to more areas to include additional groups. In 1991, it was expanded to include all the federal states. In 2001, its name was changed to Integration Through Sport and the program was opened to additional groups of migrants, for instance, uh, to refugees. Since 2015, all asylum seekers and, foreign and foreigners whose deportation has been suspended have also been able to participate no matter where they are from or what their changes of residing permanently in Germany are. And for instance, in this year, we fund this program integration through sports by 11.4 million euros. The idea is timeless and always relevant. Using sport as a bridge across linguistic and cultural differences <clears throat> to actively engage new arrivals in Germany and include them 
at the local level. Because what could be more typically German than a sports club? Well, okay, might be a voluntary fire service. But uh, we are very glad that uh, one fourth of all participants uh, of this uh, program integration through sports have uh, an uh, migration uh, background, um, about uh, 16,500 uh, participants, uh, for instance, uh, in this year. So more than 60,000 uh, participants are included in this program in this year in total. In any case, all these examples show that key projects to promote language learning projects to serve the broader community and structural projects have the desirable side effect of making typically German institutions like sport clubs more welcoming, more welcoming to people new to Germany and helping to overcome prejudice. Or to use the language of the third specific topic, helping to reshape narratives on migration. In other words, and this is a good thought to conclude with, if migrants learn our language, become familiar, familiar with our culture and are involved at the local level, their integration will be successful and it will be much easier to overcome prejudices and fears to, and to join forces to remove the fuel for populist attacks on migrants. And uh, mentioning this, certainly, I want to underline that our, all our thoughts and all our prayers are uh, with the dead persons uh, uh, who were shot last uh, evening in uh, Vienna. It was horrible to see um, the pictures uh, and uh, Certainly, we, we are really uh, touched very intensively and uh, shaken by uh, this uh, horrible um, uh, attack, which obviously has a Islamist, uh, jihadist uh, background. And uh, as I said, all our thoughts and all our prayers are with the uh, dead persons, uh, with their relatives, and certainly, especially with those uh, about 15 persons who are injured, and some of them very uh, heavily injured. And uh, certainly, we wish them all the best uh, to recover uh, fully and, uh, and, and quickly. And certainly uh, this horrible attack shows how important it is that we stand together um, everywhere in, in, in Europe. And uh, certainly uh, I can uh, underline and stress out on behalf of the uh, German federal government that we will support uh, any of our neighbors in any way uh, it is uh, needed. and. Uh, so we wish all the best now, especially uh, to all of those of you who are in uh, Vienna and uh, to the uh, Austrian society and the Austrian people. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for these important uh, words and for also delivering keynote remarks, introducing some of the most relevant issues of integration, which we are planning also to discuss over the next two days. The German model is clearly an interesting one that other countries in Europe uh, can learn from. And now allow me to uh, continue with the program after um, we had some uh, technical challenges uh, with uh, His Excellency uh, Secretary General Faisal bin Muammar. However, we are glad to see him connected and with us this morning. Uh, Your Excellency, you have the floor. Eminences, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I deeply apologize about uh, not uh, connected with you. I stayed all night uh, last night following the horrible news. And uh, for me, as uh, maybe in my uh, uh, one of this late age, I am not expert in technology. I had to have someone help me. So he came late, unfortunately. I speak this morning with a heavy heart. Kaiseed host city Vienna came under attack last night with gunmen running through the streets, firing indiscriminately at people enjoying a final evening of enjoyment and social interaction before this great city goes into a curfew and lockdown to due to COVID-19. We at Kaiseed, grave for the dead, 
we offer we offer our deepest sympathies to the families and loved ones of those affected by this horrible act. We are numb with horror that violence of this kind has found its way to this city of peace, this city of culture and beauty, this city which for centuries has been a beacon of uh, civility, openness, and compromise. I witnessed that in the last 10 years I've been living there and I feel it's the most secure city in the world. Unfortunately, this is now happening. We pledged our support to the national and civic authorities. We stand with Vienna. We stand with Austria. Those who are responsible for this attack want to achieve chaos to disrupt the normal pattern of our lives. The best way to defeat them is to carry on as a normal and to work all the harder for their unity and common purpose and to live without fear. We should live without fear. That's very, very important. And which we, we, we should call them also criminals wherever they are because they are criminals and we should not really, should not be associated with any religion. They are criminal and terrorists. With this in mind, I will now return to my speech as we listen to our keynote speaker and we were happy that we start with our keynote speaker. It is really better than my opening, I'm sure. Eminences, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I am pleased to welcome you all to the second European Policy Dialogue Forum on refugees and migrants. I hope you are all staying safe and healthy. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Foreign Office of the Federal Republic of Germany, as well as the European Commission's representation in Germany for their support in organizing and hosting this event. Almost exactly one year ago, we met for the first European Policy Dialogue Forum in Athens. We traveled to the Greek capital on full airplanes, trains, and buses. We shook hands, greeted old and new friends, not a, not a mask in sight, and social distancing had never been heard of. What a different reality comforting us today. COVID-19 show, shown us that our societies are more vulnerable than we thought, that our economies and our progress are less secure than we thought, that our communities are more fragile than we thought. But most of all, it has shown us that disasters affects each of us differently, and that the most vulnerable among us often bear the brunt of us, of it. Bear the brunt of it. People seeking refugees, uh, those forcibly disabled, displaced, and uh, stateless, and migrants are among the most vulnerable people in our communities. The number of forced migrants worldwide is at a historic highs and is growing. At the end of 2019, an estimated 79.5 million people were refugees and internal, internally displaced persons. The global COVID-19 pandemic and associated emergency further strains both refugees and their host communities. The consequences of an action are serious and will be far reaching. For refugees and migrants in Europe, COVID-19 is a health crisis, a socioeconomic crisis, and a protection crisis at the same time. 5.5 million people in Europe and European Union have already lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19. For refugees and migrants population, who often have less stable and formal employment, the impact is doubtless greater and also underdocumented. 
Forced migration settings tend to be overcrowded, making social distancing difficult. A greater level of poverty associated with the refugees and migrant communities make access to public health services more difficult. Over half of refugees and internally displaced persons are children. The COVID-19 crisis accelerated the effect of ch on children, notably with the high, uh, with heightened risk of violence and disrupted ed education. And last, but uh, definitely not least, as economic and social pressure increases, there has been marked increases in hate speeches and hate speech against refugees and migrants, often linked to their religious affiliation or to their status as outsiders. At the same time, globally, the number of refugees has reached a historical level and is climbing. Conflicts have become protected and fewer refugees are able to return home. Border closure due to COVID-19 have made accessing protections by refugees harder. This is really a fact now. It's happening everywhere in the world. The pandemic has worsened an existing problem and created new ones. We need sustained partnership between religiously motivated organizations, policy making makers, and those working in refugee hosting communities. The idea behind this second European policy dialogue forum on refugees and migrants is, is precisely to promote cooperation across the sectors, across all sectors. Because only if we join forces and join hands, we will be able to live up to our responsibilities. We know and have seen firsthand the contribution of religious organizations to refugee integration and relief. Religious leaders and their communities serve as a source of moral and ethical guidance and have often been at the forefront of calling for acceptance and welcome of the other both by governments and by citizens. Religious organizations are directly involved in providing basic services to, refugees, to, to refugee communities, ranging from food distribution to education services, to trauma care and spiritual, spiritual support. Faith-based organizations have long been involved in refugee integration efforts. There are many examples of successful public-private partnerships between religious organizations and government on this issue, refugee integration, many of which, you, uh, many of which are from Europe. I believe we will hear more of these stories over the next two days. Addressing the need of refugees and migrants at such unprecedented time and continuing to foster their inclusion and integration in spite of diverse circumstances is a shared responsibility. And it is one of that require that cooperation of faith-based and secular, act secular actors are alike. This two-day event brings together grassroots activities with policymakers, religious leaders, and academics, all of whom work on the social inclusion of refugees and migrants in Europe. And all of you bring different views, experiences, and I ideas to the table of dialogue. I am convinced that the discussion will result in concrete recommendations, shared initiatives, and joint actions. Please be assured that Kaiseed stand with you and stand with the people of Austria, with the people of Vienna, we are really one of these centers that can help during this crisis. And we really need to stand together, you know, united against all the criminals, wherever they are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your words, for opening remarks, and also for being appreciative to support this forum and welcoming our participants today.
Our next speaker is His Excellency Ambassador Jörg Vojan, representative of the European Commission to Germany, who will provide the introductory remarks. Thank you very much for joining us today, Ambassador. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Milovanovic. Uh, I'm very pleased that I can uh, participate. I'm very pleased that we as European Commission can uh, support this event. Um, unfortunately, we cannot meet in person, uh, but what's important is that the ideas can flow. And um, I have to also start, and I want to start as I served in Vienna until recently uh, to express my uh, feelings and my thoughts for you in uh, Vienna, in Kaisid. Uh, you are also based very close to the city center, so uh, you were very exposed, uh, obviously. And um, even more important, I think, is that, uh, that we stand together now, that we do not let the terrorists uh, prevail. It is their aim to divide. That's always the aim of terrorists. Uh, in this case, uh, maybe more than ever. They want to pitch people against each other. They want to do the exact opposite of what you are trying at Kaisid. And uh, we are also trying as uh, policymakers to bring people together, to keep societies together. And, um, and I think this is uh, also what we are doing when we're talking about and working on the integration of refugees in societies. And uh, I think uh, in this regard, the uh, horrible uh, attack has even made us more aware of the need uh, to, to stick together and not be divided by those who want to divide us and uh, create uh, conflict and violence. And um, as, as I tried to say, um, integration is the most important or one of the most important ways to keep societies uh, cohesive and thereby peaceful. And uh, therefore, it's very important for us uh, to support this. Uh, State Secretary uh, Stefan Meyer has made it clear that this, of course, is in the first place happening at the local level. We will not never be able to do this uh, really at the European level, but we can uh, support is we can provide the framework and we can provide the spirit and we can provide uh, some uh, financing for this, uh, which we have been doing as the European Union uh, through our um, asylum, migration, and integration fund. Um, we are also trying to uh, uh, support this through our policies. You have seen uh, uh, four weeks ago, uh, we presented a new proposal for a uh, migration package. Uh, part of this, uh, which is not only aimed at uh, the, the asylum procedures, no, it is also uh, looking at ways of integration. We will later this year, uh, present a comprehensive uh, action plan on integration and inclusion for the years 2021 to uh, 2027 uh, to provide exactly this framework which we uh, as a European Union uh, can contribute. But as I said, in the end, it's all local, not all politics only, but also all integration is local. And um, as the COVID crisis has already been mentioned before, also by a secretary uh, General uh, Bin Muammar. Uh, obviously, the COVID crisis reminds us also of the contribution of uh, refugees, of migrants to our societies. Uh, they are working in the health sector. They are working outside when uh, those more, more privileged uh, like us are sitting here in front of the screen and um, can be safe. Uh, they, because especially with their recently arrived, uh, they are particularly uh, prone to work in the difficult uh, menial and uh, labor um, sector where they are much more exposed and uh, they um, are thereby doing an important contribution which we should all appreciate I think and uh, this reminds us also of all the things uh, which uh, they are deprived of or where they have less access to to the social uh, economic and educational uh, provisions, provisions of a society. Obviously, we are all making an effort, but it, uh, especially in the beginning for newly arrived ones, it will never be um, enough. And um, uh, this is all the more important as this is the first and most important step to uh, integration. So uh, why is it important to talk about this in a religious uh, context? We as European Union are uh, not a religious organization, even though if you look behind me, the portrait of Robert Schumann, one of our founding fathers, he was a very, very convic uh, convinced uh, Christian politician, uh, a Catholic, there are even, uh, there's even a movement to beatify him. Uh, so this shows there's even some 
some religious um, uh, feelings uh, behind our international organizations, uh, obviously. And uh, one thing that uh, real religious organizations, churches and, and faiths have in common, all their traditions promote um, the charity, they promote the uh, inclusion, they promote the care for the poor. And uh, this is why I think it is obviously an important uh, context uh, to talk about integration when we speak in a uh, religious uh, context. And um, obviously, uh, uh, as uh, religions in the past have not always uh, had been in dialogue, but on the contrary, it's uh, all the more important that we do this uh, together. And I think for this, uh, Kaisit is a very, very good platform. I had the uh, pleasure and honor to uh, uh, follow even its creation when I was posted in uh, Riyadh um, 10 years ago. So um, I see what's the philosophy behind it. And I'm so pleased to see uh, that it's being put into a practice. So um, uh, practice also means not only talking about it, uh, Kaisit is even doing practical things. Uh, you have um, uh, created an integration through dialogue toolkit, which can help practitioners on the ground. And uh, this is exactly what we need uh, um, to, uh, to bring us, as uh, State Secretary Meyer rightly said, uh, to the local communities. And um, I think on this note, I will end. Um, I um, am the only institutional speaker for the European uh, Union uh, for the time being, but I'm very, very pleased that you will have two uh, of uh, your experts, uh, speakers, and panelists later who know uh, the uh, EU policies very well. In the first place, of course, Jean-Louis de Brouwer uh, himself, uh, who used to be a, a, a close colleague, and we worked uh, very well together in the past. And of course, Rainer Münz as well, a good friend uh, who knows uh, our European policies and who has also shaped our European policies. And I think both will be able to uh, do much more than I can uh, to explain what uh, we have done and we want to do at an EU level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Voyan, for your important remarks and for your support. Uh, your reminder about the role of the European Union in social inclusion processes of refugees and migrants uh, is an important one, and we all know that the signals coming from Brussels have uh, strong effects. I would add to uh, to what you were mentioning just now, who are the participants who are joining us from the side of the European Union and Euro European institutions. We will also have a keynote remarks uh, from Mr. Juan Fernando Lopez Aguilar, member of the European Parliament, uh, as our speaker for the keynote tomorrow, keynote remarks for the closing plenary. So it is really a great, great pleasure to have you all. And after now, um, after this part of the program, uh, I have the great pleasure to announce the second part of the opening plenary. Uh, we are now coming to the conversation on migration, faith and social inclusion. We have chosen these key words for the start of our dialogue today and delve deeper into how religious actors and policymakers can work on social inclusion processes of refugees and migrants in Europe. Uh, please use the Q&A button for any questions that you have for our speakers today. We are delighted to have our distinguished moderator of this session, Mr. Jean-Louis de Broer, who is director of the European Affairs Program at the Egmont Institute in Brussels. Mr. de Broer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Juganovic, for having invited me to uh, chair this uh, first panel. I'm deeply honored by uh, this uh, invitation. Uh, all the more than I'm also deeply convinced that what the dialogue that Kai Seed has been promoting over the years is more necessary than ever. And we do not need what happened in France a couple of weeks ago and what happened in Vienna yesterday to remind us of this. Mm. Uh, I mean, this dialogue is crucial per se, and I'm very glad that I have the opportunity and proud that I have the opportunity to help you in steering these two days of discussion and conversation. 
My understanding is that the aim of the opening plenary is to set out the status quo concerning the integration of refugees and migrants in Europe and to provide food for thought to the participants as they will consider and draft recommendation on the subject later during these two days. Uh, I mean, it has been structured around a series of questions which were shared with, by, with the panelists. What do they see as the most serious challenge to social inclusion process involving refugees and migrants? What, what role does uh, interreligious and intercultural dialogue have in social inclusion processes? What kind of interaction do they see between policymakers and religious leader or faith-based organization? And what should be done uh, differently? Uh, if you allow me, I would follow up on briefly on uh, what uh, my friend Jörg Wohan said about uh, the ongoing debate uh, at uh, EU level, because it will help us to better understand how to shape the scope of this conversation. Uh, indeed, I mean, you refer to inclusion of migrants and refugees, and we have to understand clearly what is going to be meant by that. Uh, when you look at the Lisbon Treaty, which is the, I mean, the founding of the existing legal framework for the Union, there is indeed a legal basis uh, for action in the area of integration. It refers to integration of legally residing third country nationals. That means that, I mean, the, the scope of the EU integration policy suffers from a double limitation. It is not including the situation of people in an irregular situation, undocumented migrant, and it is limited to third country nationals, i.e. people who, I mean, people falling in, I mean, second generation or third generation migrants, people with a migrant background are not included in the scope of these policies, which explains why the EU has been struggling for a long time between the, with the right balance to be found between on one end integration policies, part of the migration management agenda, and inclusion policies, part of the social agenda. I mean, uh, we published with a few colleagues uh, last year, about one year ago, a book celebrating the 20th anniversary of one of the major uh, documents uh, shaping the EU migration agenda, which is the so-called temporary program. One chapter of this book was dedicated to integration policies. And a few findings where they are, were still, are still very relevant today. Uh, authors noted that integration can have multiple meanings and that it can be legitimate to focus on structured elements which promote a feeling of togetherness. But at the same time, that such a sense of togetherness cannot be prescribed by legislation, since it should develop from within societies with support of state policies. And I think that really the presentation by State Secretary Meyer in the opening session of uh, this morning was an illustration of what this means. This shift is happily reflected in the document uh, that uh, Jörg referred to a, a while ago, that's to say the new pact on migration migration and asylum, which was presented by the Commission at the end of September. It says very few things with regard to integration. I mean, it's still to come. But what it says is very interesting. It says that, uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, the integration section appears under the title supporting integration for more inclusive societies. It acknowledges, this document acknowledges that too many migrants and households with migrant backgrounds still face challenges. It stresses that integration of migrants and their family is a key part of a broader EU agenda to promote social inclusion. And last but not least, it announced that the forthcoming action plan on integration, the one covering the 2021-2024 period, will recognize that people with a migrant background, i.g. foreign-born and second-generation migrants, often face similar challenges to third country national. We have to bear that in mind uh, when we are going to develop further recommendation today and not to draw a too uh, strict line between, I mean, I mean, refugees and migrants, mostly newly arrived refugees and migrants, and those who has been settling for some time uh, in our societies and who still face some form of what you could call uh, this, uh, uh, this discrimination. 
uh, there is being said uh, there is a lot of common ground between the two the two policy strands, and I would really recommend uh, those participating uh, in these two days if they have not done yet, but I'm sure that many of them have done it have done it yet already, to reread the common basic principles on integration that were adopted by the heads of states and government as soon as 2004 in the EU. I mean, these principles are still valid today. They have been constantly reaffirmed. And let me just quote the first one of them, which is literally, which I found literally in the introductory statement of the State, the state Secretary Meyer, integration is a dynamic two-way process of mutual accommodation by all migrants and residents of member states. So this as a way of introduction. As a moderator, I am also, uh, I mean, timekeeper uh, for uh, the session which will start uh, now. Uh, we are running late, but for all good reasons, because we are very stimulating introductory speeches. But I will really ask, I mean, panelists to limit themselves to the three, four minutes they were allocated for their initial comments. I will help them in gaining time by sparing a presentation of all of them. I mean, uh, bios have been distributed to all participants uh, to these uh, two days uh, dialogue, and I don't need to repeat uh, what you can find in them. In agreement with the panelists, we have agreed that we would structure the intervention that way. First of all, we're going to hear the voice of the people at stake. We are very happy to have with us uh, Shaza Alariwhawi, who has been engaged in many refugees protection movement and organization, including on the ground. I've seen that you've been active within HCR uh, Syria, and who will, I mean, I I understand, report us how refugees and migrants themselves see the challenge we are going to be looking at during these two, two days. Then we're going to have the spokesperson of faith-based organization, the three main, I would say, faith communities, respectively the Jewish community, uh, the Muslim, the Islamic community, and the Christian community, and we'll end up with, indeed, the voice of the expert, Heinrich Munz, who has been, I mean, the top advisor on migration issue, amongst others, of a former President uh, Juncker in the previous European uh, Commission. That is the way we wanted to structure this discussion uh, this morning. So without further ado, and with your permission, I will pass the floor to uh, Shaza in view of asking her really to give us the feeling of those at stake as she has been experienced that in her different positions. Shaza, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for this and, and really I would like to thank you for your remarks and your points that you already raised, which is I already have it in my uh, speech today. Thanks for the invitation and my sincere uh, condolences for all the victims of the, and the, the innocent souls that uh, went because of this uh, terrorist attack in all over the world. Even in Cabo, we hear that there is also a lot of souls went because of the terrorist as well yesterday in the Vienna and in and, and Paris and all of the part of the, uh, the, the world. Actually, as a Muslim refugee woman in Europe, I will try to talk about my experiences. Um, I'm not saying on behalf of all refugees, but I uh, am trying to bring their voices here as I am not be able to be represented for everyone. However, I'm trying, as you see, I used to work with UNHCR before as a refugees, and even now I still continue to work on refugees and migrants, uh, uh, protection and all of their uh, uh, situation uh, to bring their voices to the policymakers and to uh, to uh, um, change the narrative in general uh, in the immigration and and refugee uh, uh, policy because there is something sometimes as uh, uh, the one as I used to be as well before when I was in UNHCR to feel that we the one who have the power knows more than those people and then we try to give them the solutions from our perspective, actually, how we saw it and how we feel like this is the best way for you. And this is how my position were when I was a UNHCR staff. Now it changed to be a refugee myself. Then I saw that there is a different way of, of thinking from the, the affected community. And as a refugee myself and all hearing that through the consultation that we did, it is not easy. 
And I think uh, it's a time to, ch to, to have refugees and migrants and affected community uh, on the table of discussion and dialogue, to hear from them what they feel. Like when we hear today that there is a lot of integration happened, again, the integration is how we receive it. It's a one way actually, to be honest. However, however, it's uh, a lot of efforts happened and trying to, to try to make it as two ways uh, dynamic, but still so far as a refugee, we feel it like it's one way because we felt like it's our our uh, role to uh, learn the language, our role to learn everything about the host community. But who knows anything about our uh, our community? Who care about our uh, uh, the education and the, the knowledge that we bring it with us? Who said I am like zero? And I'm empty body and coming here just to take from you. But why you didn't take from me? But there is a lot. I have a lot. I, I think here is the point that we need to share this as, as I am a human. I'm not like as a bigger or someone like a, a vulnerable who just like need you, your hand to support. We need it for sure. But also if you uh, open up, if you welcome me, I, I can also support. You have to look at me that a mean of support, a mean of source, not as a victim or a burden. I think this is the first point. Welcoming and, and changing, I think we need to work on the media. I'm always insist on media because we need to work on many different levels. I think we need to work on media because what, what we show to the community, like if you go to look at the host community in Europe now, everyone is really fear from refugees because those refugees is Muslim, is terrorist, is I don't know. I don't know what these the bridges just that they have it. Why we didn't show some examples about those people, the background, where they come from, the achievements, what they have, what the culture they are coming from, what is Islam? There is also some problems sometimes mixing between the terrorist and the Islam and the, the religion and the, and, the, and the practices of some uh, like uh, uh, rights wings, or we can say whatever we can call them, like terrorists or whatever. Even us as, as Muslims, we are not able to talk to them. We are afraid from them. It's not about Muslims, it's about some groups. And if we take it like that, as there is a group, as we can say, for example, uh, in Germany, it was uh, uh, the, the Nazi. I cannot say every German is a Nazi person. I cannot say it at all. No one will accept it as well. So if you have this perspective, when you talk to those people, like they are all tourists, you will not be open up. You will not be able to communicate with them and help them. I think also the education, we always, as migrants, we want them to learn from school that this is our European values. This is, it's important. Seriously, it's important. But do you let them know what is the Islamic values? The Islam, I'm not, so, I'm not speaking about practices because in each religion, there is uh, uh, um, like different practices, different explanation. What is the, 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 the Jewish? What is the Muslims? What is the Christians? I think this is time to, to hear from all of them, to, to let all of them, like even the host community should know, should know those people have something. This is their uh, values. And then they can decide themselves if they want to talk to them or not. They want to help them or not, to be with them or not. As a Muslim a woman, to be honest, I really fear to walk at uh, in the streets sometimes. I really, I did nothing. I am I'm, I'm, I'm a middle Muslims or what we can say, I'm open up, I can talk, I'm going, I have no problem. But really always I feel like maybe I will be attacked by someone who hate Muslims because of the hate speech. Um, I will not take long uh, for that, but I just want to say that we need to talk to open the dialogue between uh, those communities. I think to open up if there is uh, any re uh, religious uh, uh, um, occasion for Muslims, for example, why we didn't talk about it in the, in the TV or in the, in the whatever, and why it is, what we do and how we can go together. Like I go to the Christmas market. What the problem if you go to the fest, uh, the Zucker fest or, or some festival or to just hear about it? What is this exactly? I think it's an opportunity to, to know about the others as well. Don't have this hate speech and afraid from the, the, the different because you ignore. 
I think ignores is the problem. And if the policymakers are uh, open up to have the, the refugee immigrant and refugee led organization to be there and help in, in opening the, the floor to speak, I think it will be also uh, a, a point where we turn from the head speech to learn more and know the other. This is my remarks for so far for today, but uh, yeah, I think this is the, the, the point where we have to start. Uh, thank you re very, very much, uh, Shaza. Very rich listening to you. I was reading another of these common basic principles. It's number seven. Frequent interaction between immigrants and member state citizens is a fundamental mechanism for integration. Shared forums, intercultural dialogue, education about immigrants and immigrant cultures, and stimulating living conditions in an urban, urban environment enhance the interactions between immigrants and member states citizens. You are definitely Spot on. Let me now turn to uh, Rabin Shlomo of Meister for the second contribution to this panel. Rabin, the floor is yours. Uh, I, I just need to, uh, to intervene here that uh, Rabbi Sh uh, Hofmeister is not able to attend. We were waiting until the la very last moment. Actually, the uh, attacks last night happened um, in front of his home, as I understood. So I believe that the current situation is not allowing him to join us at the moment, although he was really willing to do so. Maybe he will join us by the end of this uh, panel discussion, but uh, please, Mr. De Broer continue uh, with the next speaker and we will see until we, we close to the end if something will change with the participation of the rabbi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Needless to say that all thoughts are, are definitely with the rabbi. I mean, in these uh, very uh, indiscernible circumstances. Then indeed, Mr. De Breuer, can you hear us? We lost you for a second. Can yes, you... indeed, indeed. Okay. I mean, the, the connection was on the was broken, but I'm back. I'm back. Sorry for that. I don't know what happened. It's okay. Thank you. So yes, Iman Paravicini, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, uh, and uh, uh, a very good morning to everybody, and my thanks uh, to Kaisid uh, for such a generous invitation. I'm very glad to be part of this, uh, and uh, I'm glad also to express, if I may say, my condolences and greetings to all uh, Austrian and Vienna citizens, believers, uh, uh, institutions. Uh, I was uh, corresponding yesterday evening with uh, Rabbi Shlomo, who is a uh, a friend and a brother, we share together the Muslim Jewish Leaders uh, uh, Council uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, he has uh, told me that uh, fortunately there is no um, harm on his family, on his house. But he is just in front of the synagogue uh, uh, and uh, the synagogue was not attacked, although they were shocked by such a violence. Uh, Having said this, uh, um, I'll go to my points in these uh, minutes. Uh, as it was mentioned also by His Excellency uh, Secretary General of Kaisid Faisal bin Muammar, of course, the, the context of uh, this uh, uh, issue on migrants and refugees uh, is uh, especially on one side, the issue of poverty, the issue of violence, and the issue of nationalism that in somehow are the reasons for migrants and refugees to look for a better life abroad. Uh, but on the other side, if I think that the issue of our conference is also to avoid that from these three uh, um, causes, uh, poverty, violence, and nationalism, we uh, should not uh, have uh, 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 as a consequence in the West or in Europe, uh, ghettos, any kind of uh, violence and exclusivism. So this is where I think the key points of uh, our panel is how faith-based organizations and how faith can help uh, a better social inclusion. And this is where I, I, I jump in as a, a, a Muslim uh, president of a Muslim organization in Italy because we have been trying to uh, somehow respond to two challenges. On one side, to not to leave alone 
uh, uh, secular organizations or faith-based organizations uh, deal with migrants and refugees on key issues uh, uh, at the beginning of their arrival in Europe, which means that also uh, uh, interfaith uh, uh, cooperation can be a key example as a recommendation to try to already since the beginning give the uh, evidence of pluralism and brotherhood in, in a variety of religious uh, denominations and identities trying to help migrants and refugees uh, uh, at every level of their needs uh, since their arrival in, uh, in Europe. And you're on the other as, uh, as you can imagine, most of the, I mean, uh, many of the Muslim, of the migrants co uh, coming uh, in Europe are coming from Muslim background countries where they have faced uh, a, a, the, the abuse of religion for nationalism or the abuse of Islam for uh, conflicts. And so in somehow they have been brainwashed of some uh, universal values of their own faith. So uh, having been welcomed by secular organizations or by Christian Catholic or Christian uh, Protestant or Christian Orthodox organizations in uh, uh, Europe, uh, they might lack to understand how can they live as Muslims in the West. And this is where, uh, as Muslim organizations working in Europe, uh, we have to provide our own specific role in helping uh, uh, practical issues that, uh, that can be, uh, of course, not, not only the question of uh, prayer, preaching, fasting, diets, marriage, burial, health care, but also education for social inclusion and religious pluralism, religious interreligious dialogue and interreligious cooperation, because these are the main values in Europe and migrants and refugees coming from Muslim background with a brainwashed uh, scenario on Islamic identity and with the ignorance of how to link religious uh, behavior and education in the context of a secular society need to have the, also this training, as if I may say, a added value for their training as citizens in Europe and in the West, in order to avoid, as I was mentioning at the beginning, any ghetto, any violence, and any exclusion. So this is, uh, these are my points, especially as a faith-based organization focused on a vision of citizenship that includes also the specific identity of Muslims in our society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Imam, for this quite insightful contribution, showing how difficult it is or it can be uh, for the migrant themselves uh, to create a bridge between their community of origin and where they land at the end of uh, their sometimes very dangerous uh, journey. Uh, now, let me turn to uh, Shannon Foman. Uh, Shannon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'd also like to express our condolences on behalf of our president, Monsignor Michel Landau, who is the new uh, president of Caritas Europa, and he's based in Vienna. He sent the words on Twitter this morning uh, as a reminder, also as a theme for our message today, that love is stronger than hate. And I think that could be a, a main theme for our discussion. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the organizers for enabling Caritas to be the, the Christian speaker in the panel today. It's quite an honor, especially when there's so many experts in this field. Um, but Caritas does see itself as an arm of the church, and um, we have been working in the area of migration, um, starting from the drivers that force migration to the long-term um, integration of people. Um, so it's uh, we have certainly a lot of experiences on this topic. It's interesting with the first question about the most serious challenges we see to social inclusion uh, for refugees and migrants in Europe today, because I was just answering this question um, on October 21st in response to the European Commission consultation on integration and inclusion, which was mentioned earlier. 
And in this um, consultation and also based on our uh, project, which um, incorporated a, a European public, a European research um, in 11 uh, member organizations of Caritas, as well as a European report, where we identified um, actually three main challenges. The first being the high extent of discrimination against migrants and refugees, xenophobia and racism, which is then of course reducing and limiting trust. This was already mentioned before. Um, and the focus of course of um, the burden of responsibility for integration is often put on the migrant or refugee him or herself as uh, was already mentioned. But it's also the question of how perfect does one have to be to finally be accepted as a full participant of society. Um, the second challenge is the socioeconomic challenges. Um, we've already mentioned the limited access to essential resources such as housing, education, quality health, social services, and also social protection. Um, but what we continue to see is the prevalence of um, migrants and refugees among high poverty statistics um, and suffering from these major socioeconomic challenges as a result of potentially uh, links to discrimination and not full access in society. And the third challenge is the negative portrayal of migrants in the media. Um, one of the main findings of our research uh, that was funded by DG DEFCO, uh, it was a three-year project called MIND um, that's actually still going. It was extended for uh, six more months because of COVID. But the aim of this project was to raise awareness on the relation between universal sustainable development and migration and the EU's contribution to development cooperation. Um, and we thought that by raising more awareness about the drivers that force people to move would contribute to reducing the negative rhetoric in society about migrants. But unfortunately, as was also already mentioned, the presence of nationalism, um, the pitting of people against each other, uh, for whole population groups actually, um, and these sorts of developments are being manipulated by the media and spread um, with even less control now because of social media and the use of internet with people hiding behind autonomous identities without uh, necessarily having to uh, define themselves. And so this spread of hate on the media via the media and social media is, is rampant. So these three challenges is what we've identified to be major challenges. And we think that of course, much needs to be done in terms of intercultural, interreligious dialogue. Pope Francis has brought out his new encyclical uh, recently, Fratelli Tutti, which is all about um, the relationship with our neighbor, with each other, um, the need to engage and, and develop these relations to continue to create spaces of encounter, to dialogue, and to make sure that we get to understand um, the different understandings and, and, and opinions of, our, of the partner with whom we're speaking, and that we respect also these differences of opinion and these different experiences. And that's part of the friendship. That's part of the dialogue that we continue to discuss with each other in this understanding of difference um, and, and still agreeing to disagree and move together in dialogue as neighbors. Um, so I'll stop there to respect the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I mean, a lot of reference to this uh, sense of togetherness I was referring to earlier and also stressing the importance of one of the topics that will be further dwelt with uh, during these two days, the reshaping, the need to reshape the narratives on migration, uh, as uh, Shaza did in her introductory uh, comment. Let me now turn to uh, Heinrich Munz. Heinrich, the floor is yours. Yeah, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm also in Vienna currently, um, and so we are we are negatively impressed by the situation that we have experienced over the last uh, 12 hours or so. Um, let me say that the integration of migrants um, is an issue that depends uh, both on the, the gate of entry, so the conditions under which uh, migrants are coming um, to a destination country and um, the perspectives 
um, these people are having um, on the ground. Um, and these perspectives are defined by migration policies, um, integration policies, and uh, citizenship policies. I think it's important that we, we understand this full range of uh, conditions. So refugees usually do not come for economic reasons to a particular place, but because they seek uh, uh, protection uh, from a situation they are fleeing. So it's about violence. So the skills they are bringing uh, to the table are not necessarily the ones that are needed in a destination country. Sorry. Um, this means that refugees need particular attention, not only when it comes to schooling, but also when it comes to reskilling, upskilling, increasing the match between their skills, way beyond language, yeah, and the needs of a particular labor market. Whereas if migrants are recruited for particular jobs, the likelihood that they can also then fill these jobs and start um, working from day one is much higher. So this really the question how to integrate people depends on the conditions under which they are coming um, and the talents um, and ambitions they are bringing along uh, when coming. Um, at the same time, the question is what kind of perspectives are um, uh, receiving countries offering? Under certain conditions, so for, for example, if you are recruited uh, by one of the Gulf states, um, the perspective from the onset is clear that most of the migrants coming to a country like uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, for example, will not stay for good, but they are recruited for a limited period of time and uh, the stay is uh, linked to a particular um, economic uh, task or job. Um, under these conditions, the incentives to integrate are much smaller uh, because you know that uh, you will have to go back some someday. Whereas if the perspective is that you stay for good, um, I think it's important then to understand that you have to integrate because this will be in your, your new home and you will you will spend the rest of your life there. So I think the, the, the question of integration or the incentives to integrate also depends on which conditions are offered and to what extent um, uh, migrants have a perspective to stay on. Not all migrants stay for the rest of their lives uh, in the receiving countries. Some people move on, others go back. Uh, um, many refugees, uh, at least in the beginning, hope that they will go back to their home country, although statistics show that the return of refugees has become less likely. Uh, the rate of return has been declining over the last 15 or 20 years. Now, the question of faith that comes into play and is one of the issues that we are discussing this morning and today also has to do with the fact, what is the experience I'm bringing along and what is the experience that I'm having in a destination country? So if you come from a country where you have experienced faith-based and religious homogeneity and you migrate to a country where the majority of people have a different faith, then maybe for the first time in your life, you are not only experiencing becoming a minority yourself, but also you're experiencing diversity. This is the experience that some of the migrants are having when coming from one country that is home, more homogenous to a country where they find themselves in a minority situation when it comes to faith. At the same time, countries that had a more homogenous uh, um, population in the past with immigration are confronted with diversity as well. And I think there it really depends upon what kind of learning processes uh, we, can, uh, we can start. And um, interfaith uh, dialogue and faith-based dialogue is one of, the, one of these learning possibilities uh, to, to help uh, both migrants, but also uh, receiving uh, societies and communities uh, at large uh, to develop a different perspective. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to the discussion that we're going to have today. Thank you very much. Over to you, John.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Heinrich. And by the way, thank you very much to all our five panelists, because while sticking uh, strictly uh, to those very uh, narrow time limits that were imposed on you, you managed to all of you pass very, very, very insightful uh, message. Uh, before uh, turning uh, to uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the audience uh, and, and asking the back end facilitator whether there are questions uh, in, in the chat, I would also inquire whether uh, Rabbi of Meiser uh, is about to join us or if we have to uh, leave him a slot or not uh, during the some I would say 10 minutes uh, which remain available. I'm turning to you Dr. Alexandra George. As far as I uh, I was informed uh, I think he won't be able to join us this time so we should continue with the program as planned uh, uh, and hopefully next time uh, we will have the chance to uh, to include him in the program and to have him. So, Mr. De Broer, you can continue with the program as planned. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, may I ask whether uh, there are questions uh, from the audience? Uh, I see uh, one question addressed to uh, Imam Palavicini. How do you counter polarization effects, anti-Semitism and racial discrimination about migrants through interreligious action? So I think that uh, the question is how to uh, tackle the issue of polarization and division uh, through interreligious action and, and dialogue. Uh, this question is addressed to you, Imam, but I think that uh, certainly uh, Shannon and others uh, panelists might have their views on the same question. Uh, Imam, the floor uh, is yours. Well, uh, the counter polarization as the counter narrative for discrimination or victimization is only through inter-religious cooperation and inter-institutional cooperation, which means that uh, the true polarization that can really uh, share a common engagement for the common good of society is through cooperation. The cooperation has to be done with new skills and with a very focused agenda which means that we need uh, uh, responsibles from several uh, religious communities that can be engaged uh, with the knowledge of the context and of the issues and of the solutions with as well the institutions of the local, national and uh, European uh, um, institutions. So this is, I think, a very practical solution. It's through dialogue and cooperation as the true way uh, of uh, countering any kind of hate speech or polarization of radical interpretation that, uh, that can be, of course, then uh, uh, managed uh, uh, um, specifically, but as a, uh, in, in terms of uh, the needs of migrants and, and refugees, and in terms of citizenship building and social inclusion, uh, the practical methodological solution according to my experience, is interinstitutional and interreligious cooperation. We don't hear you, moderator. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. Uh, still not completely familiar with how to use Zoom after all these months. Uh, I'm uh, strongly reminded that we are getting near to the end uh, of this session, but let me simply turn very briefly to the other panelists about this question as how to counter polarization. Uh, do you have uh, views which are, yes, I see, uh, Shannon, please, the floor is yours. Yes, um, I think from the perspective of Caritas, we start earlier in the process. Um, what's really important to remember is that when a refugee or a migrant arrives to the country, their first interactions are going to influence their willingness to uh, integrate, where the emphasis is always put on their responsibility uh, to adapt and, and adopt the values and the language of the country but it's really much more about how are they received? What is the asylum conditions in the country when they're arriving? Are they put in proper housing or are they put in tents on the side of a road after a more a fire, for instance? Uh, so there are numerous examples that will influence a person's um, willingness to, uh, to, yeah, to adapt, but beyond that, the spokesperson already was speaking in terms of um, what happens when they first arrive, if they're able to, to have quality jobs and integrate in society through the labor market. But even beyond that, 
a lot of people aren't able to even access the labor market. And if they are, they're getting underpaid uh, and they are filling gaps um, that are hard to, that for them, they're not necessarily having their skills recognized to the full extent, and they're potentially in jobs that are below their qualifications. Um, what, what is really important for, for us in our work, we've got several publications on it, and I can provide the hyperlinks in the chat, so you can continue to, to see different examples and promising practices, but we believe that integration takes place not just with the migrant or refugee him or herself, but with the community together. So it's mm -hmm. the integration of the local community as well in the process. And community sponsorship is one example that involves many stakeholders in the integration process, government alike, um, as well as local church faith actors um, and, and migrants and refugees themselves as they receive people. And this initial reception is so valuable for contributing to the sense of belonging, this ability to participate fully in society, and to be recognized for the contributions these people are bringing to our society, and not only to our societies in Europe, but also through successful integration back to their countries of origin as well. So I'll add some tweets, but uh, some links, but this is really important from our perspective. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid, uh, Shannon, that this will be the last intervention during this panel. Uh, at least, I mean, I will use my privilege as a moderator uh, to come with maybe uh, two final sentences, three final sentences. Uh, I really hope that all participants have enjoyed this session and will make best possible use of all the insights that were shared with you uh, in the beginning of these two days to enter into the more proactive phase of this dialogue during the next uh, session. Point two, uh, there was one dimension which was not directly tackled during this, uh, this uh, introduction and that I might not find completely reflected in the program and it's what I would call the political or institutional dimension of integration. And here again, uh, I mean, I would refer to one of these sacrosanct common principle I was referring to earlier. It's about the participation of immigrants in the democratic process and in the formulation of integration policies and measures, especially at local level, supports their integration. I mean, in a way, Shaza referred to this in her intervention. Last but not least, uh, least if you all participants need something to nudge you during these two days, uh, we can take it uh, from the joint statement that was adopted uh, by the heads of states and government last week when referring to the situation in France. The last sentence of this joint statement reads as such, we call on leaders around the world to work towards dialogue and understanding among communities rather than division. And it reminds us that those who are leading this world uh, have also bearing a major responsibility on how the all issues that we are going to discuss during these two days are shaped down to the local level. Thank you very much to the organizers for having or given us the occasion to share uh, these views in the opening of these two days. And passing the floor back to you, I wish you the best of luck and mostly to come with very strong policy-oriented recommendation uh, by uh, tomorrow when you will bring these dialogue to a close. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. De Broer, for your words. Thank you, uh, thank, all, thank you all participants for this engaging and truly inspiring session. We believe that uh, it has already initiated some new ideas and inspired our participants to prepare for discussions that will take place in the following working sessions. However, before we uh, proceed further with the program, I would kindly ask my colleague Johannes Langer, program manager of the People Seeking Refuge program at CAICID, to join me in providing the framing of the forum in order to explain what is awaiting us in the next hours today and tomorrow. Johannes, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alexandra, it's appreciated. Um, in the following, we want to share with you what is going to await you during the next two days. In the first place, why are we here? The Policy Dialogue Forum is envisioned as a bridge which brings together policymakers, religious leaders, civil society, and academics, but also refugees and migrants themselves. 
in order to create a space for dialogue, addressing some of the most relevant questions nowadays regarding the social inclusion of refugees and migrants, namely inclusive education, building trust, and countering hate speech. As Mr. De Brewer mentioned, this is certainly not all encompassing, but these are the three specific aspects that we are focusing on. We are particularly interested in how faith-based actors and religious leaders can contribute to that conversation. We are doing that in order to come up with proposing policy recommendations that shall be relevant for policymakers from the local up to the European level. We want to use these two days so that there is the possibility to bring forward these relevant ideas to your stakeholders and improve the current situation, as difficult as it may look at the moment. Highlight initiatives that are working well and pave a way forward. It is indeed ambitious what we want to achieve, and we are delighted that you're interested to be part of this journey. Now, after this opening plenary with all the excellent contributions that we have heard, how are we going to make that happen? Those of you who signed up for one of the three working groups will have four interactive sessions ahead of you. You will follow one of the three tracks that you have signed up for and stick to this track for the time of the forum. Together with some other 20 participants or so, you will have the chance to come up with policy recommendation proposals that are going to be presented in the closing plenary. The first and second session are about the current context of the uh, situation of social inclusion of refugees and migrants, building what we have already learned um, in this opening plenary, including opportunities and challenges and how to best address the status quo. The first two sessions that will happen today include an input speech of five to seven minutes in each track that provide food for thought from important experts. Please note that rather than providing a Q&A session, the short intervention serves as a basis for further discussions and exchange among all of you in your Zoom meetings. The third and fourth session focus on generating policy recommendations and presenting the way forward. There won't be any input speeches, but rather it will be all led by you, guided and facilitated by your main facilitated, facilitator and further support members from the Network for Dialogue, as well as from KC, so that you can feel as comfortable as possible and use the time available. The opening and closing plenary are recorded and can be seen later on on Kaseed's YouTube channel. The four working sessions are not recorded with the exception of the input speeches. The rest of the sessions will follow the Chatham House rule. During all working sessions, we would kindly ask you to keep your camera on for better interactions. Alexandra, I hand back to you to address further questions. Thank you. Further question would be what we will do. Uh, led by your facilitator, Maya Nenadovic, Stefan Shashua, and Frederike Meet, uh, there are going to be three tracks. Maya will be in the lead of the track one on inclusive education. Steven is going to cover track two on building trust in local communities. And finally, Frederike will facilitate track three on changing the narrative of migration. As lined out in the track description that was shared with you, you can see an overview uh, of the framing and direction we would envision for that conversation to go. We have also put forward guiding questions for you, it, would, uh, it will really depend on you and your own input uh, to allow for active discussions. Regarding the process, you will find six colleagues in your working group that are there to support you. The main facilitator is guiding through the process. The two co-facilitators are coming from the Network for Dialogue, will help guide you to stay on track. The backend facilitator will help you with technical developments and the rapporteur will take notes on the main findings of the session. Finally, there will be also a technical person for any support you would need and if you face any technical challenges. Uh, a lot, uh, although we are gathered online this time around, we keep the same methodology which was used last year in Athens, interactive participatory and dialogical sessions where all participants have the chance to express themselves and be actively involved as contributors to the overall aim of the forum. Uh, furthermore, uh, what we are aiming to do is to propose policy recommendations from the three working groups that will serve as a basis for further planning the way forward with Network for Dialogue members and policy forum participants 
interested to further contribute with their expertise to work on a joint strategy on dissemination of the policy briefs in 2021. This European Policy Dialogue Forum would therefore be a unique opportunity to begin to share both challenging and promising practices of social inclusion, especially in terms of how different stakeholders, both those working on grassroots level and or in a po on policy level can find their respective ways to participate constructively in building inclusive societies across Europe. Many thanks in advance for being part of this effort and we are here for you to feel uh, to make you feel comfortable during this time. We hope you have enjoyed this opening event and we will continue with the program of the policy forum. Please keep in mind that you have received the zoom links for your respective track. After the short break at 11 punctually, we are going to be divided according to those tracks. Follow the Zoom link that was shared via email to you and uh, you know uh, which group you already belong according to the list of participants you have received and you were assigned to and have chosen to be so. Enjoy the break in the meantime. Thank you for our uh, great speakers. Thank you for a great moderator, Mr. De Breuer. Thank you everybody for joining this uh, opening and see you at 11 uh, punctually. Thank you very much. Bye.